Dr. Karl Krizanitsky has more than 30 books to his name answering questions about how the world works. He's a living national treasure and has also received an American award for his groundbreaking research into naval fluff. The title of his latest book is very cheeky, Fifty Shades of Grey Matter. Karl, welcome to Booktopia. What's the connection between marshmallows and willpower? Back in the 70s, a scientist, a psychologist, got a, some 600 kids aged four to six. Here's a marshmallow kid. You can have the marshmallow right now. It's yours. Take it. Eat all you like. Or you can get this marshmallow and you can wait for 15 minutes. And if you cannot eat it for 15 minutes, I'll give you two marshmallows. The majority of the kids tried. A few kids said, bugger that for a joke. I'm just having the marshmallow right now. The majority of the kids tried to wait and the majority failed. And he wrote it up in the paper and blah, 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 didn't care about it, talked to these kids as they grew up. His kids were the same age as these kids, noticed some trends over the years, came back and looked at the kids in the 80s, the 90s, 2000s, and finally wrote the last appraisal last year. Basically, the bottom line is that if you, can wait, if you as a four to six year old can wait the extra 15 minutes, you will be more successful at school, at university, at your technical college, in your future career, because Self-control is an important part of succeeding. Roughly twice as important as IQ. And what's so fascinating about your writing about this in the new book is that you say that willpower is a finite pool. And you can run out. And so you've been trying to be good all day with regard to something or other, and at the end of the day you lose your temper or you eat too much because you've run out of pool. And what you've got to do, or run out of that little pool, and what you've got to do is recognise that it's coming and say, I have run out. I am human. I'm going to go to bed and do nothing. I'm not going to yell at you. I'm not going to gobble my way through the kitchen. I'm going to go to bed and go to sleep. Sometimes there's so much to do you just have to go to sleep. So you can train this muscle. And the trouble is if you come from a large family, or if you're poor, under both those circumstances, it's bad to put things off. So if you put off getting the lollies, everybody will just eat them straight away. They won't be there in the future. So you've got to get into it right now. But that can be trained. It is not impossible to be trained. See, you say to a kid, see that marshmallow? You can eat it right now. Or I can teach you some tricks so that if you can wait for the 15 minutes, you'll get twice as many marshmallows. And those tricks can go on down the line. I'll say it again. Self-control is twice as important as IQ in predicting your success at university. It's amazing. And at high school. You've dedicated this book to the Higgs boson particle. Yes. Tell me why you did that. I'm intrigued by that because it seems to me that you have made a, a life out of explaining many of the inexplicable phenomena of science and, and making them accessible. But the Higgs boson appears to defeat just about everybody when it comes to a simple explanation. Ah, after five years of working on it, I can give you uh, two 60 second explanations. Go. You remember atoms at school? Vaguely. They've got a central core and then they've got electrons. Okay, look at the electrons first. Those electrons inherently have no mass and no size. I don't mean a small size. I mean they've got zero size and no mass. Okay, let's look at the core. It's made of protons and neutrons. In turn, they're made of up quarks and down quarks. Once again, no mass and no size. You are made of particles that have no mass and no size, and yet you have mass and I size. I certainly do. How come? Hmm. And the answer is how come? The answer to how come is the Higgs field. The Higgs field, when these particles interact with them, it gives them this weird thing we call mass. And the Higgs field came into existence about a tenth of a billionth of a second after the universe began, and in uh, July this year, 4th of July in Melbourne, it was announced that we proved, we, the human race, had proved that the Higgs field existed. That was the whole big deal about the whole thing. So that's the first part. Okay, so you're okay. with me so yeah, far? Just. So the Higgs field gives mass by interacting with these particles. And by the way, whenever it interacts with one of these particles, the quarks, the electrons, a Higgs boson is exchanged, right? So that's where you get the Higgs field and the Higgs boson. Okay, now the second part, what use is it? Okay, imagine that you are an intelligent farmer of one and a half, two centuries ago. 
never been to the ocean, never seen a compass. Pretty smart, know how to do animal husbandry, can deliver animals, can grow the crops, build a farm, look after the family. Yeah, yeah, you're a smart person. And you go down and you see a ship and they say, hey, have a look at this. You've never seen a ship before. Have a look at this compass. What's the compass? And they say, there's a bowl of water. And on the bowl of water is a cork. And stuck onto the cork is a nail, which is magnetised. You don't know what magnetised is, but it's pointing north, south. And they say, just rotate it around so it points east or west. And you do that. And blow me down, by itself, it goes back to pointing north. Ooh. You have just experienced a magnetic field. You can't smell it, mm -hmm. you can't taste it, you can't see it, but there's a proof of it there. And a little bit later, a guy called Michael Faraday combines two invisible things to give us one useful thing. He combines this invisible thing called the magnetic field with another invisible thing called electricity. You can stare at a wire all day, you can't see electricity. And those two invisible things gave us the electric motor. In the same way, someone living today, or their children, someone soon, will do something with the Higgs field that will give us a machine that we'll use all the time, and we won't even realise that there was ever a mystery about the Higgs boson. So, for example, Einstein comes up with his theory of relativity. A year later, a century later, it's used for GPS. Mm. Scientists go looking for the black holes evaporating. Within 30 years, it gives us Wi-Fi. So in the same way, the Higgs field will give us maybe loss of mass. Suppose you want to send a colony ship to Mars, weighs a quarter of a million tonnes, too heavy. Mm -hmm. Why has it got mass? Because of the Higgs field. Suppose you could magically wipe out the Higgs field. No mass. Suddenly you can move it at the speed of light. See, there's a whole different world ahead of us. It's wonderful. I love the way you tell that story as if there were a little element of magic there, but of course there isn't. It's all science. But I love the way you tell the story. Well, magic. Magic is a technology you don't understand. That's right. Yet. That's right. So I want to know, Carl, what was the first question of this kind that excited you as a child and made you think, this is what I want to spend my life doing? It wasn't a question. It was reading an astronomy book. And as I read it, I thought, whoa, it had pictures, lots of pictures. Uh, I was seven years old. <laughs> whoa, New South Wales is big. Australia is big. Oh, my God, look how big it is. The world is big. I could spend my whole life exploring the world and never get there. Mm. I spent two years in the outback. I know nothing. The solar system is huge. Oh my God, there's 400,000 stars in our galaxy and there's 400,000 million galaxies. And I had this feeling of awe and wonder. 400,000 million stars in our galaxy, 400,000 million galaxies. Since of awe and wonder, I knew that we would never ever get to know everything. There'd always be something we didn't know and I've never lost that sense of awe and wonder. <laughs> now with the title of the new book, the very cheeky title of the new book, do you think of the brain as the final frontier? I mean, we've just been talking about space, limitless yeah. kind of space in a sense, but the brain, isn't that also kind of the most exciting territory to explore? The brain and human consciousness. For example, there's you in the daytime and there's another Caroline Bohm who exists in sleep. And when you're sleeping, you are not wasting time vegetating. There is a whole different consciousness. And that other person that you only ever get glimpses of through dreams, mm. that other person can make movies that are so funny and can design wonderful clothing and be a nuclear physicist, and you never meet that person. And I remember I had this fascinating encounter with my other half when I had discovered the secret of the universe in my dreams, in my sleep. And so night after night, I would come across the secret of the universe and I'd forget it when I woke up. And one night I said to myself, write it down, write it down, write it down. And I went to bed with a notepad and in the morning, there it was on the notepad. Write it down, write it down, write it down. I'd forgotten to write down the secret of the universe. I just wrote down, write it down. <laughs> but the brain is a magnificent frontier, mm. but the human is another frontier. The proper shape for a human, according to Freeman Dyson, is a cloud of iron vapour weighing 50 kilometres, 50 kilograms, the diameter of a planet floating through space. You still have sex. I mean, after all, Frank's ever said. That's a relief. Yeah, well, your main sexual organ is your brain. Quite. Right? It's not the squishy bits. It's up here where you have sex. That's a pretty squishy bit too, actually. Yeah, but not squishy in any other sense of the word. No. And so you can still have sex and you can travel through space without a spacesuit. 
Good. and be immortal. So we are in the early stages of the genetic revolution where we can make chemicals that we want, we can get bacterial fungus to make them, we can grow organs on a laboratory bench and implant them, we can then, we've done that, we can then rebuild organs, diseased organs, inside the body on the run by swallowing something or injecting something. We can then do it to all of our body parts and become immortal. Is that a good thing? Immortality? Well, no. Just what you're saying there about building body parts. Do you have any reservations about what we can do with the knowledge we have and will have about genetic manipulation? We can use it for good and we can use it for bad. And it's up to the populace to know about it and to be informed about it so that they can become part of the decision-making process. Remember, the purpose of a state is to take money from the citizens and if they don't pay up, to put them in jail. And it's up to us citizens to keep the state in line. Do you have faith in us being able to keep up with the science and with the ethics that go with the science? It's hard because from a glass of water, I leave behind on the rim enough of my DNA to make an exact copy of me. You have to grow it in a friendly uterus for nine months and condition it for 20 years to make it socially useful, but th that potential exists. So we need not just the scientists, but the painters, the artists, the musicians, the sculptors to bring this to the general public. And the pendulum goes one way and the other with the state taking control, the people can taking control, and for no rational reason I'm optimistic that we'll muddle through. If you've ever wondered why the sky is blue or why it gets dark at night, then Fifty Shades of Grey Matter will help you make sense of the world in which we live.